Thanks for stopping by my channel. In this course, we're going to be covering recon for web applications and bug bounty hunting. My goal in creating this course is to give you the best shot at finding a really good target that you're going to find vulnerabilities on. A lot of bug bounty hunters who do this every single day usually just run some kind of subdomain enumeration and then they go out and see what's there and start attacking those specific subdomains. And for the rest of us, we may want to find easier targets that have not had as many people attack them. I want to help you find the really old subdomain that maybe has been forgotten about that's out of date and is going to have a lot of vulnerabilities or possible vulnerabilities for you to find. This course is going to focus purely on recon. Sometimes you're going to come across videos that say we're here to focus on recon and then they're going to start showing you how to look for sensitive information disclosure and that's not really going to be our purpose. This is purely about finding really good targets for you to attack. And I decided to go ahead and show you one or two tools that is going to help you in this process in each specific area of your recon. And the reason I decided to do this is because when I was new, I remember reading through books and listening to other people talk in podcasts, and they would cover five, six, seven, eight different tools. And I remember thinking, there's no way I'm going to remember which one to use and in what specific case. And then a lot of times these videos or books didn't even tell me which tool was the best. So I've narrowed it down to one and most of the time two tools that is going to help you in your recon phase. And I decided to show you two tools most of the time because sometimes one tool won't be working and you need to know of a second that is going to work. So I've decided to narrow it down to the best tools that I think are going to help give you the best chance and the most success in finding bugs. So I've gone ahead and streamlined this course for you and I believe it's going to give you the best attack surface and the best chance at success. Let's go ahead and jump into it. In this video we're going to talk about how to scan specific targets in bug bounty programs as well as fuzzing our targets without getting ourselves into any trouble. I know there's a lot of interest in learning how to scan and fuzz bug bounty targets because sometimes you'll be reading through a program's rules and it will specifically say that there is no scanning allowed. Now there's a couple of ways to get around this and if you watch my Shodan video you can actually use Shodan to scan your bug bounty targets and then you don't have to worry about anything because you're using Shodan and that is one way to get around scanning a target and staying in the clear. Now you can use InMap and fuzzing tools to do this as well and that's the purpose of this video. So we're going to go ahead and look at this and I'm going to show you how to do this without getting yourself into any hot water and to be able to scan these targets without any issue. Before we get going too far I want to explain to you why you're not allowed to scan these specific targets and there's really two main reasons one the company doesn't want a bunch of bug bounty hunters using fuff which is going to send several hundred requests per second to their server and have them get dosed and sometimes if you do this you will actually get rate limited or even have your ip banned which is why i always recommend using a vpn but there is a way to go around this and i'm going to show you that at the end of this video and the second reason a lot of programs are going to tell you they don't want you scanning their network is people will use vulnerability scanners and this is just really a big no-no don't use vulnerability scanners. Recently, a program went live and then they were getting scanned so much with vulnerability scanners that they actually removed themselves from the bug bounty program. So don't use vulnerability scanners. These are the two big reasons why a lot of programs will say no scanning. And so just be aware of that. If you're going to fuzz for directories, make sure to slow down the amount of requests, which I'm going to show you how to do. And don't use vulnerability scanners. Now, first, I want to show you how to use InMap without getting yourself into any trouble. I've, so I've gone ahead and opened up Tenant from Hack the box here. If you follow my channel at all, you will know this is my go-to box for web app education. And the first thing we are going to do is run an in-map scan. So we have opened up our terminal here and you're probably familiar by now with an in-map scan. Now this is the typical in-map scan that I like to run. I'm going to change the IP right here. So if you would like to jot this down, this is how I run an in-map scan if I'm doing a capture the flag. But we are not doing a capture the flag. We're going to be scanning a bug bounty program and, and it's going to look a little bit different. So we still want this dash A. We will want a dash capital F and this is only going to scan the top 100 ports. The reason I'm telling you to use the dash F is because if you're new, you're probably not going to know which ports you want to look at. So I have a list of ports that I use when I run an in-map scan because you don't want to scan all 65,535 ports. I think that's how many there are. You want to scan just a specific number of ports. A lot of networks are not going to want you going out and scanning their entire network. But it's okay to go out and scan the top 100 ports. They're probably not even going to notice and I'll show you how to make it so that they're not going to notice and you're not going to cause any kind of intrusion and they're not going to care. So we want to run the dash F. 
for our ports and then you're going to want to run a dash t and then a one or a two this is going to really slow down your network scan i think that inmap runs on a t3 automatically and if i'm in a hurry and i just want some ports to shoot at if i'm in a ctf i'll run a t5 that's as fast as you can go but if you run a t5 in a ctf you can actually miss some ports so if you're really nervous about running any kind of scan you can go ahead and run a t1 and they're not going to notice that you're scanning their ports this is going to really slow down your inmap scan and then this dash v right here will tell you open ports as it hits them so this is going to run a really slow scan on the top 100 ports and nobody's going to notice so you can go ahead and run this and it says that there are two ports and it's going to pop down with the ports as it hits them and so eventually you're going to see port 80 pop up and i'm not really sure what other ports are open on this program but this is how i would run an in-map scan and so you can see right here it tells us that it's scanning the top 100 ports all right so i decided to go ahead and add in this in-map network scanning legal issues page so if you have any questions about using in-map legally on your specific targets and you're still worried about it you can come and read this right here and it's going to give you a kind of the legalities of using on different networks i am not a lawyer so i decided to go ahead and add this disclaimer in there that you are using this at your own risk and you should check with the laws in your specific state on port scanning so this is how i would run an in-map scan if i'm running one on a bug bounty program this is going to be a really safe scan to run and it's going to tell you the information that you want from these specific ports which ports are open what versions are running on your target so you can go ahead and play around with in-map this is how i do it though and i want to show you how to fuzz for directories in a safe manner and you may still end up getting rate limited which is fine especially if you have vpn you can just switch your vpn so we're going to go ahead and run fuff now and this is the syntax for fuff i'm going to show you this with this common word list right here and then we'll go ahead and download sec list and you can see a better word list than what is default on the kali machine we can actually see what we have as options here and you will see that i'm using the fc to filter out specific codes that I don't want to see. And I think I had a 402 on here, a 403. I don't want to see the 403s, but you can leave those in if you want. And then you can filter with other ways, but we're looking for that dash P and it is right here. And it's going to tell you how to delay your requests and you can slow them down by however much you want from anywhere from 0.1 seconds to two seconds in between requests. Okay, so we have this request here and let's say we really want to take our fuzzing really slow. You can run this with a two second delay or a one second delay in between requests. Um, we don't really need to filter out by the not founds and then we're gonna run our word list and we're gonna run the common word list the common wordless.txt. So if you want to, you can go ahead and run it just like this and you will have this word list. So if we run this, you can actually see right here, the progress, you can see the number of requests that are being sent. And so it's sending 37 requests every second, which is actually kind of a lot. Um, one of the things about Fuff is it is really fast. You can actually, we'll actually show you how fast this will run without slowing it down. And you can see right here, it's sending 680, around 600 requests per second. And that is really fast. You're definitely going to get yourself rate limited or, or picked up running requests that quickly. But Fuff is my go-to tool. I often tell people that you can run Derb just like this and you shouldn't find yourself in any trouble because Derb is pretty slow. But I like to use Fuff because of the options that are available with it. Now, I want to go ahead and show you how to install Seclis. I'm actually going to come back here. I do have Seclis already installed, which will save us some time, but you can come out to Google, go to their GitHub page right here, and you can run a Git clone. So we'll copy that right here. And you'll want to CD into your opt, and then you can type in a Git clone right here, just like this. And you can see it's the last thing I actually installed on here. This will take a little while to run, and then you can CD into the Seclis, and you can start looking through all of the different word list that they have in here. So you have a fuzzing directory, you have a discovery directory, and I actually think the discovery has some pretty good word lists. And then we can CD into 
the fuzzing because that's what we're doing and there is all of these different word lists for you to pick from when you're doing your fuzzing so this is how i would recommend scanning a bug bounty program if you are looking for specific ports to be open or you are checking for directories so good luck with your bug hunting we're going to be covering the tool showdown for the purpose of bug bounty hunting and searching for vulnerabilities as well as information disclosure and how to use the tool within the command line as well as the actual browser. Shodan is an excellent tool for those who are new to the world of bug bounty hunting or those who are timid when they read a program and it says that you should not scan a network and you don't really want to run InMap and you're too afraid to actually scan the network, you can go check out Shodan because Shodan scans the network automatically and then stores all the information in its database. So all we have to do is know what queries to run to pull the information from Shodan and read their information from when they have crawled the network or the web browser previously and then we have access to all of that information without having to scan the actual target and you don't have to worry about breaking any program rules so the way Shodan works is it actually goes out and crawls every single device that is connected to the internet whether it be your thermostat your refrigerator or your web security cameras and it'll see if there's any vulnerabilities it'll store the information such as the software that is currently running on it and if it has any vulnerabilities it is now open to the web and anyone can access your information your thermostat your refrigerator your webcam or even your printers if they have any vulnerabilities then the whole world will know it because all they have to do is query that specific version such as WordPress 1.4.7 and if you have a web application that is running that specific WordPress version the whole world is going to know it because there will be a CVE on it and you will be open to a potential attack so the way it showed in works is it just crawls all of the internet and stores all of the information that it can possibly grab for anything that is connected to the internet so what we're going to do in this video is run queries on Shodan but because we're going to be doing this with a free account you're only going to be able to run a very limited amount of commands or scans if you're actually wanting to use the Shodan scan feature you're going to actually have to pay for it I think it's $70 a month which is kind of steep I personally would rather just scan it myself with InMap and look at the ports I specifically want and read the information that comes back that way but I know that some of you would probably rather just pay the $70 a month and have access to the monitoring feature that we're going to cover a little bit later on so typically when I think of the people who are going to enjoy Shodan Shodan the most. I often think that black hat hackers are going to be the ones who love Shodan the most because it stores all of the different version numbers and if a new CVE comes out and somebody says okay we have this vulnerability to this specific software they can just scan all of the internet and find out what devices are running that specific software because black hats don't really care they can just attack anything but this can also be helpful for bug bounty hunters as well because if a new CVE comes out you can go out the same way as a black hat would and say Shodan show me all of the devices running this specific software that are vulnerable to this CVE and then you can download all of those devices and look through them to see if there are any web applications that are running that specific software and then see if they have a bug bounty program and report it. This is going to be kind of tedious but it'll be really easy bugs to find and vulnerabilities to report because all you have to do is read the downloaded file and look for open bug bounty programs on those specific web applications. So an example of Shodan being used in a really massively way kind of for an unethical purpose can be seen on Darknet Diaries. I forget the name of the specific episode. I think it came out a couple months ago and the guy goes by the hacker giraffe where he actually used Shodan to look for vulnerable printers and he printed subscribe to PewDiePie to over 50,000 different printers. He was able to do this really easily and really quickly because he was able to just use Shodan to look for vulnerable printers. And so in that episode of Darknet Diaries, I think you can just look up Darknet Diaries hacker giraffe and listen to it if you want. All that guy did specifically was go to Shodan and look for vulnerable printers and it seems like that's kind of one of his go-to tools is to go to Shodan look for some vulnerable software and then look at all of the devices that happen to be vulnerable to that specific software or CVE so let's go ahead and jump into it here we are I have gone ahead and opened up a terminal which you will want to do and then you will also want to go to Shodan.io I'm already logged in you'll click login over here I personally just log in with Google and this is a non-paid account so we are going to be looking at basically the exact same setup that you're going to have when you first open up Shodan. The first thing we're going to do is be using Shodan from the terminal. So if you just come in here and type in Shodan and hit enter, you're going to get a bunch of options. Now these options are going to be default and Shodan should already be installed on your Kali Linux machine. 
So I'm not gonna actually walk you through how to install Shodan because we're gonna run it straight from here first in the terminal and then we'll go through and actually check out the browser version later on. I've decided to show both the terminal and the browser because there are some people who really like running things straight from the terminal and you'll be able to play around with it and figure out exactly what you like and then there are other people who like to have a graphical user interface and they'll like the browsing version better and so what we're going to do is go ahead and initialize our Shodan for the terminal and you can see this right here this init so we're going to end up running a Shodan init but we also need to have our API key so you'll want to go ahead and log in so you'll want to go ahead and create an account and log in to Shodan just like this and then you will click account and you'll be able to grab your API key right here so we'll copy this and come back to our terminal and we're going to type in Shodan init and then you will paste in your api key and hit enter and it tells us that it has successfully initialized and now we are ready to start making some shodan queries so the first thing we can do is just run a shodan info right here and see what it tells us about our accounts so we can type in shodan info and then to enter and it's going to tell us we have zero credits available and scan credits available and that is probably because i have already ran some queries with this over here on the website but it's not really going to make a difference i'm going to show you how to run these queries i just might not get the results back that you will every time you make a request whether it is over here on the actual browser or it is inside of the terminal it is going to use one of the credits that you have but you can always pay and subscribe to Shodan and have more credits most of the bug hunters who are successful will have a paid subscription to Shodan and they really like using Shodan and we're going to cover why it's helpful but personally a lot of the stuff you're going to be able to get on Shodan you can find your own self by running some different tools which I've covered on my channel previously but that is not the purpose of this video so the second thing I want to show you is often when you want to run something like let's say we want to run this uh, Shodan scan right here what we can do is we can run Shodan scan and then a dash H and it's going to tell us the options for the actual scan right here. So you can run a Shodan dash H and then you can run the Shodan scan dash H and it's going to tell you the list of commands that you can run with each one of these with each one of these commands that comes first. So when you're using Shodan, it'll be really helpful for you to know that you can run the dash H with each one of these so that you know exactly what you're going to be getting back and exactly how to get the information that you want in the future. And a lot of your understanding from these right here is going to come from playing around with them and reading the documentation and just pressing the dash H on each one of them and figuring out what exactly they do. So one of the first ways to check out Shodan is we can just say Shodan and then count and then we'll say WordPress. And when you run this, this might not work for me because I don't have any credits. But when you run something like this, you can see that we just want to count the number of results for this search. So what will happen is Shodan will go out and count all of the servers that it has in its database that are running this WordPress right here. And it actually did tell us. It tells us it has 52. But if you wanted to run something a little more specific, I spelled that wrong. That makes more sense. Um, so 500,000. So if you were to run something like this, you might want to say you were looking for a WordPress version 1.4.7 because that's what your target is running or there's maybe a new CVE out there and you just want to see, okay, what web apps are running WordPress 1.4.7 and then you'll get Shodan will give you a list of those actual web apps that are running that and then you can see if any of them have a bug bounty program and then report to them, hey, this new CVE for this WordPress has come out. So it saves you from having to go out and actually find a specific target and then looking to see what it is running because Shodan will actually do the heavy lifting for you. And so all you have to do if you are a bug bounty hunter is say this is the version, a brand new CVE has come out for it. So you'd say Shodan 1.4.7, which I actually don't even know if this is a real version. You would run this and it is and you would say okay there's seven web apps that are running this version 
currently in the Shodan database. And then you would just go out and look to see if any of these seven have a bug bounty program. And if they do, you can report, hey, the CVE came out and you're vulnerable to it. And so that's a really simple way to find bugs and it's all based on recon and you really don't have to do any heavy lifting. Very simple, you've seen how fast this has gone and you could potentially have found a bug if this version were vulnerable to a CVE that had just come out. So if you're familiar with Nmap, what Shodan does is pretty similar. It goes out, scans the network and it brawls all of the internet and pulls the banners, the versions, um, what's running, if it's Apache, if it's Windows, if it's got WordPress running, and what ports are open. And so with Shodan, we can just query all of this and it stores this in the database. And that's how it already knows that there is seven web apps running this WordPress 1.4.7 because it is already, all it has to do is check its database and it doesn't actually have to go out and scan. But show, but we can scan with Shodan and we're gonna look at this in a little bit, but I just want you to know how Shodan works and it already has stored all of this information on there. So now you can see how this is kind of a go-to tool for the black hat hackers because they don't really care if these seven web applications have a bug bounty program or not they just are going to attack it and see what information they can get out because they don't really care about following the legal rules and the law but as a bug bounty hunter you need to make sure that these seven web apps if they were vulnerable to a cve that could attack wordpress 1.4.7 you would want to make sure you do everything legally that you actually don't exploit the CVE. There's no need to actually go and try and exploit it. You can just report it. Hey, there's a CVE that came out and you are vulnerable and you should be rewarded for it. And so as a bug hunter and a penetration tester, we're looking for very specific targets. And then we can just run through the seven real quick and see who actually is vulnerable. So now if we actually want to see what these seven web applications are that are running this WordPress right here, we can use the download feature within Shodan. Now, I personally, if I was attacking a specific target, would just run Nmap instead of using Shodan for this. But I want you to be aware that you can actually pull down version numbers of web apps with Shodan itself. But personally, I would run Nmap just to grab the banners and the version of a specific target. This is something that you would be using if you were just looking for a CVE that just came out like we were previously talking about and we would use the download function for this. So we would just grab Shodan, and then we would say download, and then we're gonna download the file as, let's say WordPress file. And I'm not actually sure if it will work with this version number, I've only ever ran it without the version number. So maybe we can throw this inside of quotes and see if this works. If not, we will just run it without quotes and see how that runs. So we'll run this and it has saved five results into our WordPress JSON file .gz. And we can unzip this and grab the file by typing in g unzip, and then we want to run our WordPress file. And then if we ls, we should have our WordPress file .json. And I do not have gedit installed because this is a new machine. And if you don't have gedit installed either, you can sudo apt update. And I've already done a sudo apt update recently. So I'm going to sudo apt install gedit and this will only take a second to download. And now we can gedit our WordPress file right here and we can look at the contents and this looks really messy. So what you can do is actually just copy this, hit a command A and a command C and then we can come over here and we can just type in BEA Utifier like this and we can just click on the top one and see if it will work for us. Paste in the JSON for us and type, you can click beautify. And now we have our results right here. So it actually looks the same over here. It actually didn't make any difference. So maybe this one doesn't work for us. It tells us we have an error. Okay, we're gonna just look at it right here. So you can actually see right here, you get a hash, you are told it's from Shodan, it'll tell you the region from where the web app was coming, where the web app is coming from. It's going to give us the time that it was crawled. We get the server that it is running on. And we have all of this different information here that it that Shodan has crawled from 
this specific target, we actually grab an ASN number. If you were looking for a specific target and you needed to and you needed to pull down a version and you were looking for a specific CVE and you wanted to download so you could actually see what the Shodan databases have stored for the WordPress 1.4.7, instead of just seeing, oh, there's seven of them, you would download it into a file just like this right here and then you would unzip it and then you can g-edit and actually look at the contents of the file and find the servers and the subdomains, the URLs, the AS numbers, and there's a lot of information in there that's gonna be really helpful for you in your recon phase if these targets are actually vulnerable and they do have a bug bounty program. So one of the other things you're able to do with Shodan is run a is to run an IP address on the Shodan crawlers and so you're and one of the ways to grab an IP address so one of the ways you're going to be able to find the IP address there's several different ways that are going to be really easy so if we wanted to run just say a host yahoo.com it's going to give us back right here this range of IP addresses that are running on yahoo.com and if you wanted to just ping yahoo Dot com we will be told right here is one of the IP addresses that we were able to ping so if you look for this 74.14326 we can scroll up and see that this is one of the IP addresses right here you're actually able to find IP addresses through burp as well so what we can do is come over here and open up a new tab type in yahoo.com and we can open up burp and intercept with the proxy and if we run this you'll actually be able to see right here on 443 you have this 9837111163 and if you come back here you should be able to find right here and so there's a several different ways to find IP addresses for a specific domain I'm actually going to close out of this but this is one way to do that and then you can just type in shodan and then we would type in host and then we can grab one of these IP addresses that we just saw and run it within Shodan and it's going to give us some information right here. It's going to tell us that this port 80 is open and port 443 is open and it'll give us other information if you specifically want to look for an SSL certification you can find those and it's gonna tell us it's running these different versions and you can go check to see if these SSL versions are out of date or what you can do with these. Within your recon phase, you also get these other host names right here that can be associated with IP ranges and you can run a Shodan host with an IP range and it's gonna pull down a bunch more information for you within the entire range. It'll give you all of the ports that are open within with the IPs. And so the difference here between what we're able to find between Google and Shodan is Google goes out and crawls the pages to see what is reachable, but Shodan crawls all of the internet connected devices. And this is why you would find a refrigerator that might be connected or a webcam or somebody's property cameras or literally anything that is connected to the internet like a thermostat. And Shodan actually crawls everything that is connected to the internet and stores the data. So one of the good things about running Shodan like this is sometimes you are going to come across bug bounty programs they're going to tell you that you are not allowed to scan a specific network and as new bug bounty hunters I know there is a lot of questions about what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do and so Shodan is a great way to scan a network without actually scanning a network because Shodan already has stored all of the information that you're going to be looking for and you just have to go out and find it you have to know what commands to give such as this one right here if you're looking for open ports I personally would rather just run in map with the ports that I want to find such as port 22 port 80 443 1443 3389 or whatever other ports you might come across but I would rather run in map with specific ports but I know there are some people who really worry about this and Shodan is a great option such as this Shodan host right here to grab other domains you can grab subdomains and you can scan for ports and IP ranges. And so this is an option if you're worried about scanning a target in order to grab subdomains and open ports. And what I like to use for running subdomains is AMAS, and I'll go ahead and link my AMAS video in the description if you would like to learn more about that. So let's go ahead and look at scanning a host instead of just looking at this right here, the Shodan host. So with Shodan, you can actually just type in Shodan, we'll go scan-h, 
and we can look to see what our options are for scanning a IP. And so it tells us right here, we can scan an IP and we can say Shodan scan and then we can give it the IP that we want. And we'll just run this same IP address right here and see what information it gives back to us. It tells us we need to give it a command. So we can say submit right here because we're going to submit an IP address. It tells us that I don't have any credits to actually run this scan submit. So I would need to actually go and pay in order to get my I my API key right here, some credits, but I am not going to do that. So this is another way to go ahead and scan a network or an IP address to find what is open and do a little more recon with this. You can also go out to, I've, I can never remember what it's called, Hurricane Electric. I think it's vgp.h. E .net. All right, so here we are. We can just type in yahoo.com and I've shown this before in another video. So we'll just go Yahoo and this website seems to be running really slow, but you would just run the search up and it has come back. So you can grab these AS numbers right here or these ASNs is the easier way to say it. And I would run these through AMAS personally because it would be easier, but you can run these through Shodan as well. Shodan is going to be a lot faster because all it has to do is query back to the database, whereas AMAS seems to take quite a bit longer in getting you the information back. But you can come out here and grab a network range, scan a network range. You can look through these ASNs and see what you can find right here. I've already made a video about that, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. But like I said, I personally would go with Nmap if I was going to scan any kind of network or anything like that. Now we're going to move on to the web browser. So what's really cool about running Shodan in the browser is they give you this filters cheat sheet. So if you wanted to look for a specific network or a range or a cider range, you can do that right here through the search filter. And the way you would do these commands is by typing in, say we wanted to find the organization Yahoo like this, we can search it and it's going to pull it down for us. Let's see what else I've ran up here we delete this, we can run an IP address and we already ran this one and it'll pull down the information. Here's that port 80 that it said was open. Here's port 443 and it has grabbed us all of the banners right here and we can read through them and see what is running. You can also download the reports from here as well. One of the cool things about oh, one of the cool things about running through the browser is you can actually look for sensitive information disclosures. If you just continue to look through here and you'll need to read through the cheat sheet. And I would also recommend reading through like their documentation because there's way more examples that you're going to be able to use. So if we wanted to look for something that's running Apache with a specific Apache version, you could look to see if you're able to run, maybe there is a Apache 1.7.4 that actually has a vulnerability. You can come up here and you can just type in the product Apache with the version number and see if you're able to find any vulnerabilities for that Apache version, just like this. And you would run through here and say, okay, these people might be vulnerable to this. Do they have a bug bounty program? Okay, these people are running this version. Do they have a bug bounty program? And so there's a lot of different ways you can be creative with looking for known vulnerabilities, new CVEs, looking for bug bounty programs that are vulnerable. And then you can look for sensitive information with Shodan because it doesn't know what is going to be sensitive or not. It's just going to grab all of the information and store it in the database. And it's up to you as the bug bounty hunter to look at that specific target and see if there's any sensitive information being disclosed on Shodan and then you can report it. Okay, and one of the last things I want to cover is the monitor function and you have to have an account in order to use this but this is something that you might be interested in the monitoring is you can enter in a specific target such as yahoo.com and it will update you whenever a new software comes out or whenever there's an update made to the program that you are trying to monitor it'll let you know and you can be one of the first ones to go and check out that new subdomain or domain if it is in scope or if they update a software, you can be one of the first ones to go see if there are any CVEs out for that specific 
software that they have updated. So the monitor is one that bug bounty hunters really like to use because you are able to get notifications of when things change on a specific target and you'll be one of the first ones to know, one of the first ones to be able to go out and test it, but you will need to be willing to pay $70 a month. I personally don't think it's worth it, but I know there are a lot of bug bounty hunters who do think it's worth it. So it might be worth it to you to monitor and just pay the $70 a month so that you can follow specific targets and be one of the first ones to go out and check those targets for vulnerabilities. So that concludes our video on Shodan. One of the things I want to make sure you understand is that when you run a Shodan scan and you're thinking about trying to exploit something, you need to make sure that it's in scope and has a bug bounty program. Otherwise, you could be getting yourself into some illegal trouble. And make sure before you go ahead and start looking at a specific target to see if it has a bug bounty program so if you have any comments or questions please let me know down below and i'll try to get to those as soon as i can thanks for watching we are going to be covering how to take notes for the world of bug bounty hunting or maybe you are wanting to become a penetration tester note taking is going to be really important to you and your method of note taking and actually being able to go back and overview what you have already done and gone through your checklist is going to be really important so in this video i'm going to show you how i take notes and we're going to use cherry tree within linux because everybody's going to have access to this. I personally use OneNote, but it's going to be really similar to what I'm going to show you in this video. Some of the benefits of taking really good notes is going to be having organized thoughts and being able to write a really simple proof of concept. You'll be able to have screenshots and be able to see what you have previously done. And you're not going to waste a lot of time going back to subdomains that you've already enumerated and looked at because you already have all of your notes there for you and know that you've already looked at it. And if a new vulnerability comes out, you can go and see when the last time you enumerated enumerated, looked at this specific subdomain and know if the new CVE is going to be applicable to this specific domain and the software that's running on it. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into it. So here we are on our Kali Linux machine. We can come up to the little drop down menu and we can type in cherry tree and it will be automatically installed if you're running at Kali Linux. So using cherry tree is going to be really pretty simple. The first thing you're going to want to do in your notes is you're going to have the main domain and all of the information that you found on it. So you can type in the domain.com and this is going to give you this parent node right here. And you can also change up your note taking method and maybe you want to have the main domain and you have each subdomain right here like this you could have a subdomain one only it would actually be the subdomain name right here and then you'll have all of your notes from that subdomain but if you do this there are some programs that have like 800 subdomains and this would take forever to do but you can come in here and do every single subdomain like this and so it'd be if we could just say sub.domain.com spell that wrong like this and then you would have all of your notes within this specific subdomain. So if you decided to go this way, one of the things I would suggest doing right out of the beginning is when you put in your first sub node is maybe just call this the software right here. And you can run, you can say that it's running some kind of CMS, maybe it's running WordPress, and then you'd have the version of 4.2.0 four and then you can know that this is what's running so that way in the future if there's any kind of cve that comes out for the wordpress version that's running you can come back to this subdomain and see if it's vulnerable to that new cve another reason you're going to want to have some kind of list of the subdomains so let's go ahead and delete this one right here so it looks a little better if you decided to run a bunch of subdomains in here so we can type in sub1.domain.com and in here you have a list of all of your subdomains. You can have actually subdomains in here within this specific thing that you're looking at. So in here we could say software and you can see how this is going to organize our research for us. And inside of the software in here you would put your WordPress and then the version that it is running. So these are a couple different ways to kind of organize your notes. And another way to save time instead of actually going through and typing all of this out is on this box, I already have Wappalyzer installed. So I could just come, we can come to the browser and type in like google.com and open up Wappalyzer to see what information is there. And now we could open this up right here and I could just screenshot this and pull that screenshot over to 
my Kali machine and then I can put it into Cherry Tree. So I could grab this and pull it over and put it into Cherry Tree. I actually don't have this specific Kali box set up to do that, so it's not gonna work for this one. But on my actual personal Kali Linux machine that I use, I can just pull screenshots back and forth over to my Kali machine and save them inside of Cherry Tree. But I use OneNote, so I don't really have to worry about that too much. So screenshotting and adding information in here is going to be helpful as well if you have that capability. And one of the things I like to do is at the end of a recon session is make a node like this and we'll just call it a recon node. And then in here I write down all the tools I ran and the way that I collected all of the information. So that way I have a clear set of notes and that way if I ever come back to this specific target, I can see if maybe I've missed something or maybe I've learned some kind of new recon technique that I can try out on this specific target. And I'll know what exactly I have done on this target and what I can do in the future to further analyze the information on my specific target. So make sure to write down your methodology of your recon and attack because it may change in the future and you might be able to go back to old notes and old targets and further do enumeration and testing. And lastly, one of the things that is gonna be really helpful for you in your note taking process is to have some kind of a checklist. And so one of the last things you're gonna to wanna to have is a good checklist of vulnerabilities and recon. And you can just go out to Google and look for a bunch of different checklists and find whichever one works best for you. Maybe copy paste it and put it into a Word document and modify it and make your own. But in the meantime, you can just Google bug bounty checklist and click on one of the checklists and then look to see what is in here and you can follow their recon. Maybe there's something in here you don't like. I used to use HTTP probe, but I decided I actually like going out and checking things manually, so I don't use this anymore. But it would be helpful for you to have something like this, some kind of checklist, so that way you don't miss any bugs or vulnerabilities or maybe hidden subdomains that you would have otherwise missed without a checklist. So this will be really helpful for you as you're working on your recon skills in the future and developing them. So there's a lot of ways to take notes. I showed you Cherry Tree only because it's in Kali Linux and everybody who is going to be running a virtual machine is gonna have access to Kali Linux and they're gonna have access to Cherry Tree. But I personally use OneNote and maybe there's something else out there that you like to use. All right, we are going to look at a URL real quick and look at the different parts of the URL just so you can get an understanding of of what is going on when you look at these. It's really important in your recon phase to be able to know what URLs look interesting that you can copy and paste into your notes so that you can come back once you have finished your recon phase and actually start testing. So I've gone ahead here and just typed out a basic example and you're probably all familiar with HTTPS and the HTTP protocol and it is labeled as the schema. The www dot is not always there. This is labeled as the subdomain because sometimes this could be a this could be a subdomain listed as sub.domain and so this is actually a subdomain but that is the same thing as the www dot and so right here we have the domain name which would be like google.com and i'm not really sure why the dot com is actually listed as the top domain level because you can use in here like dot uk dot fr um, for different countries, a .net, a .org, for an organization, and it's still called the top domain level, but that is this portion of the URL. So all of this is a pretty basic. You can fuzz this right here, the subdomain, and the most popular subdomain fuzzer that I can think of is wfuzz. I'm sure you can use other fuzzers, but wfuzz is one that seems to work really well for me when I'm doing a subdomain fuzzing. And then right here is when we start to run into the, the path or the location to the contents is how I have it labeled here. But I usually think of this as a directory, this as a directory, and then eventually you're gonna hit a actual page and you can actually delete some of these and you could just go to blog and see what's there but this is the path or the location of the page now here comes kind of the good part for us to look at and before we move on you can actually fuzz for different directories right here the same way you would fuzz for subdomains and look for different directories within the subdomain or domain and now when we move on to right here the question mark what you need to remember about the question mark within in the URL is that it signifies a query and a parameter is about to be dropped in. And this is where we can start messing with the URL to see what information we can pull back from the server. So you can try you can try and look for an LFI, an RFI, an SSRF, 
and actually right back here you can look for directory traversals but you have a parameter usually it'll be labeled usually it'll be labeled as something other than parameter one of the ones that automatically throw up a red flag for me is when i see a parameter that says url and then this query you're going to look to see if this is querying the actual server itself and if it is you can start to look for a server side request forgery or something along those lines but let's say this just has like an id right here of 42 and you can go ahead and start changing this 42 to other numbers and see what information you can come back and maybe see if you can access some information that you're not supposed to so this is a url and one of the reasons i wanted to show you this is because when you're in your recon phase and you're not yet testing to remember to save urls that look really interesting to you with different parts that you're able to change or fuzz that you think might pull back some information that you should not have access to in this video we're going to talk about how the dns works or the domain name server so if you decide you want to type in something like google.com how does your browser know where to go and find the google ip address to resolve the web page to you so i googled how dns works and had to go through a few pages before i found something that was actually good for an example and i thought this was a really good example so we're going to go ahead and walk through it so you have a person right here who types in a domain right here and they type in dnssimple.com and it will check the web browser's cache which you will see right here on your local machine to see if you have visited this page before so if you ever go to facebook.com and you're logged in in the future next time you go to facebook.com it automatically logs you in because you have stored your session and cookies in your cache on your actual browser so it will automatically log you in but if you log into facebook.com using firefox and then you go to Chrome and you try to log into Facebook.com, you're gonna to have to re-authenticate because it doesn't have that stored in your browser cache. So the first place when you type in a web address, it is gonna to go to the web browser to see if it's stored in the cache. And before we move on here, you can see right here at google.com, they have an IP address for that. The reason you have actual domain names attached to IP addresses is because it's easier for us to remember a domain name such as a Facebook rather than a string of numbers for facebook.com or a bunch of other web apps. We just remember we need Google. We don't need to remember this string of numbers right here. So the purpose of a domain name is to give you an easy way to remember the contents of a specific IP address, which is gonna to resolve to either Google or Facebook or Wikipedia, as you see right here. So that is the purpose of the domain name. So after your browser tries to gather the information and it's not able to, we can go to the next page and it shows the packets moving out to the ISP server which is going to be your internet service provider, which we're told right here. And it's going to ask, how do we find this website? And it is going to tell us that the root server knows where to find the location for the .com TDL. And we've talked about the TDL before. It is the top level domain, which can be .com, .org, .edu, .uk, .fr, and many others. So those will be the top level domain servers. And it's gonna tell you to go out to the root server and the root server is going to give the information back for which TDL server you are looking for that's gonna contain the information you want. So if you want the .com TDL or if you want the .org TDL, and the root server is going to pass the information on to the next server in line to give you the information. So here we are at the root server and our packets are going to make the request and we're going to be told that it doesn't know where to find dnssimple.com but it's going to be able to tell us where the, the TLD is located and it's going to send us on our way. So you can see here is root and here are the TLDs and it's going to send us to the right one. So before we move on too far, if you're wondering how this would work with say something like the Tor browser, my understanding of how the Tor browser works is that it's going to encrypt all of your data so that the ISP isn't actually able to track the web application that you are trying to reach. And the Tor network opens up a bunch of nodes for your encrypted data. And it doesn't actually go through this process until actually 
until after it has reached the exit node and that is how your ISP, your internet service provider, is not actually able to track where you are sending your requests to. And the same thing would work with a VPN as well. So on to the next page, and it gives a little bit of a history that we don't really care about on the TLDs. And finally, we make it to the .com TLD, and it's going to say here is the name server 1 and the name server 2, name server 3, and name server 4. I'm not actually positive, but I think all domains will have four name servers. So if you host with Cloudflare or Google domains or, and I'm pretty sure with any other hosting companies, you're going to have this NS1, NS2, and you're going to see this when you're actually setting up your domain to resolve to a specific IP address. So it's going to send you to the name server at this point, and you get sent on your way to the next page. And here you make it to the NS1, and the NS1 says, I can give you the IP address. And then you get the IP address and you're able to resolve to that specific IP address that you queried in the beginning, such as google.com. So I hope this made sense. If not, um, you can watch it again or you can read through this. You can see the URL is right here for you to go to, or you can Google around and read maybe something else that explains to you how DNS works if this was too confusing. And if not, you don't necessarily need to know all of this information to move on into the world of ethical hacking, but I thought it'd be helpful for you to understand how the web works. All right, in this video, we're going to cover a tool that is called dig and it will check for zone transfers you're going to hear about zone transfers it is a great way to find additional subdomains you can use fuff and gobuster and wfuzz and try and brute force for subdomains and use sublister but you can also use dig it's really quick and if there are any subdomains it's really helpful tool because you'll find them right away so a dns zone transfer is supposed to replicate a DNS database between DNS servers, which means if it is vulnerable to a zone transfer, it will give us information like subdomains and some other information, which we'll see in just a second. So we'll go ahead and run this. I have opened up the box friend zone from hack the box because it is vulnerable to a zone transfer and if you find a bug mounting program that's vulnerable to a zone transfer you're not actually able to exploit it and hack per se the web application but when you find a zone transfer and something is vulnerable to a zone transfer you'll you can report it as information disclosure because it's something that should not be open to the world so the easy way to test this is with a tool called dig and we'll just type in dig so we'll go dig a x f r and then we will say at and then we're going to use the ip address and then we'll use friend zone because that is the domain that we are after dot red and then we can run this and see what it spits out for us we have friend zone, friend zone, friend zone, and administrator one. So this would be something that would be worth checking out. We have this HR, we have an uploads, which would also be something worth checking out if you're doing a CTF or if you find this information out in the wild. And so you can actually save all of this into an out file and we'll just call it zone just like this. And then from other recon that is done on this box, you also find a another domain called friend zone portal just like this and we can run it and we find admin files imports vpn and you have all of these files as well and so if you double care it it will just append to our file so if we cat out zone we have all of this information and now if you have taken my little bash course you know that we can cat out the zone and we can go like this and we can say grep friend zone and make sure that works and so it'll point out it'll give us all everywhere that friend zone is located and then we can say grep in and then we want to awk for our cut and go ahead and put in our curly braces and quotes and we can say print dollar sign one because we only want what is at the front of this file 
and then we will see what happens. Yep, that's what I thought was gonna happen. It gives us what we want, and then we can say sort dash u, and this should get rid of our replications right here, and it does. It sorts it out for us, and we get rid of a lot of the repeats. And now you have this nice little happy file with just the subdomains that we have pulled down from the zone transfer. So a zone transfer is something you should always look at. And if you're in a hack the box, you might have to add more of these to your Etsy host file. But out in the wild, these would be really good targets to go ahead and try to attack and find exploits on. So this is the zone transfer with the dig tool. You'll want to remember it whenever you see a port 53 that is open. That is the port that is used for a zone transfer. So a few things to remember about this specific tool. If you run an in-map scan, port 53, if it's open, you can always try for a zone transfer and see if you can pull down additional subdomains it's a great place to grab subdomains you can also report it as information disclosure if you are actually able to pull off a zone transfer so with that we will move on to the next tool all right i want to cover two more tools that are recon tools that you're going to hear about but i don't really use a whole lot because i don't think i get a whole lot of helpful information from but you're going to see these in pretty much every penetration testing textbook every certification course you ever come in contact with and they are who is and ns lookup we do ns lookup real quick because it doesn't give us back a whole lot of information so we can just type in ns lookup just like this and then you can do something like www.google.com and it's going to tell you their ip address the domain name you're going to get the ipv6 name back and it's going through port 53 and so this is a tool you would run if you see port 53 open same as dig and you can get just a little bit of information back with ns lookup so you'll hear about this and you will definitely see it in the future this is what it does but then there's another one that you're going to hear about and see regularly and it's who is and so if you type in who is google.com you're gonna get back a whole bunch of information. And if you're ever doing like a penetration test, this is actually a good one to run because sometimes you can get back email addresses and a phone number and things like that about the company, but you can find out a little bit more about the company. So right here you see they're using the Google domain servers right here, which isn't that surprising being from Google. But if you look at this right here, who is Google registered with. It's not even registered with Google domains, which is kind of ironic that Google is not does not have their own domain name registered with themselves. I'm guessing they must trust this mark monitor more with security than they trust themselves, which I mean is saying something. I think Google should probably switch that. But anyway, if you know why they're using Mark Monitor instead of Google domain names, then you can feel free to let me know in the comments. Maybe they're just using it just because they've never changed it once Google domains came out. Anyway, this is who is, and it just tells you more information about the domain name and where it's registered and the kind of the security behind it and who's running it and you can look up to see if there's any vulnerabilities or anything like that you're probably not going to find a whole lot from who is other than just about the domain name where it's registered who's it registered with an ip address and basic information like that so these are two tools that you're going to hear about for sure in the future and would be worth remembering but I don't use them all that much because I don't find them to be that helpful. I wanted to let you know about them because you will see them and hear about them in the future and now you know what they are and what they do. Another tool that would be worth your time investigating is the Harvester. It looks like this and this tool will go out and look for other domains and subdomains and it will also find email addresses if you're a penetration tester for you to try and target and the usage is really pretty simple you just type in the harvester and then you would pass in a domain with the dash d and then you can pass in the source that you want to look for something so you would just use domain dot com and then let's say we wanted to use google you can put in a dash b 
and then google.com or any of these other options down here for the source and it will go out and it will try to look for domains and it will scrape all of these search engines for subdomains email addresses and things of that nature so the harvester is a penetration testing tool that you're going to hear about from time to time and it's one to be aware of and know that it exists you're probably not going to use it in any pursuit of certifications or ctfs but it is a really great recon tool and one you should know about and be aware of I'm going to be looking at cert sh i've gone ahead and pulled it up here this is actually the second time shooting this video because i forgot to press record the first time but when all else fails when you're looking for subdomains the cert.sh is going to be a great place to come it's going to give you the certification tickets for the domain that you are looking at so we'll go ahead and open this up and i'm going to type in tesla.com and we can hit search and look at the subdomains that it pulls down and you're interested in this middle row right here because if you look at this closely you can see these subdomains right here for tesla.com and so this will give you a bunch of subdomains for you to go out and look and test for bugs and see if there's any information out there or anything you want to test against when i look at something like this one of the first things when you have so many subdomains is to see which ones look specifically interesting to you and then you can go and check those but always make sure that they are in scope so you'd want to make sure that this assets first of all is owned by tesla.com and then you'd want to make sure that it's in scope and second a tip is to look for the dev typically these dev sites and these dev subdomains right here are going to be hosting information or new software or new code before it goes live on the actual main domain and so these devs are always something good to look at another one that's good to look at is look at like admin portals and see if you can get into any of those or fuzz for directories because there might be something there that you might need authentic authentication for in order to see but you can access it without being authenticated so the devs the admins pages like those this api would be interesting to look at and so you can come in and look at all these subdomains if amas and sublist are not pulling back enough subdomains for you you can always come to srt.sh and check this out so in this video what i think we're going to do is i'm going to show you how to grab all of the different possible url targets for you within a bug bounty program and then we're going to start to narrow it down to the urls that are actually responsive and then the ones that i think will be helpful for you to target as a beginner and so i'm going to show you how to find the most obscure urls within bug bounty programs for you to target but always make sure to remember that these urls are in scope that's going to be really important so always check that because sometimes you'll see urls that maybe are several years old and a specific bug bounty program has for gotten to remove them and you're going to think this is a really great target but it will end up falling into the category of out of scope so make sure as you go through your recon phase to only target urls that are in the bug bounty scope this is something that i really struggled with in the beginning i would end up out of scope so you don't want to do that all right there is something called the wayback machine which is really cool and we're going to be utilizing this and thanks to tom nom nom for making a wayback tool that is really going to save us some time as well as a couple of other tools so if you want to check this out online you can type way back into google and you'll be brought to the way back machine and we can come right in here and it tells us at the top that it has saved more than 737 billion web pages and let's go ahead and check out what this does so we can type in yahoo.com and it's going to give us all of the screenshots that it has taken of yahoo.com from October 17th, 1996. So this is why it's called the Wayback Machine. And it doesn't just take screenshots, it'll actually store the URLs. And you can go back and check out the timestamps and it'll show you what the web page actually looked like at that time. So if we click back here to the year 2000, 
and let's say we want to open up February 29th, 2000, we can do this. So we'll right click, say open in a new tab, and it's gonna render what that page looked like for us from its archive, which is pretty cool. And so this is what the main page looks like, and some of the HTML might not render quite right, but that's okay. So we just really wanna grab the URL and a lot of the links that were available at that time, just in case they are still being hosted on our specific target and they have not removed them, which does happen. Programs and companies will be hosting up specific subdomains and then after a while that subdomain is no longer in use and this is really common with with blogs on large companies say that PlayStation comes out with a new video game they'll create a subdomain all about that video game and then they will forget about that video game and years pass by and that subdomain will still be up and it won't be updated and it might be vulnerable to new exploits and CVEs and so that's why we want to look back into the past and see if we can grab any subdomains or URLs or links that may lead us to bugs that other people have not checked for within those forgotten subdomains and links. So this is the Wayback Machine. You can come in here and get a feel for how it works. And now we're gonna go ahead and install the Wayback Tool by Tom Nom Nom. So what you will do is come to Google and you're just gonna type in Wayback Tom Nom Nom and it's gonna be the first tool here for us. And we're actually gonna to have to install the Go language before we're able to install this. So what you can do is open up a terminal and come in here and just type in go. And if it doesn't turn green, then you do not have the go language installed. So what we're gonna to need to do is run a sudo apt update just like this and let this update. And if yours doesn't update or gives you some kind of warning, you might have to run a sudo apt upgrade and then run the sudo apt update. So now that we're all update, we can run sudo apt install go lang like this. And we'll say yes. And now if we type in Go, it should turn blue for us or some other color, meaning that we have the Go language installed. So we can come back to the Tom Nom Nom site and we can just highlight this and it's gonna, and we can just copy this right here and it's actually going to install the tool for us. And I think it installs it in, in the directory Go slash bin. So I'll show you that in just a second. We can paste this in, and I think we're gonna have to run this as a sudo. Okay, so when I ran it with sudo, it didn't work for me. So when it actually installs the proper way, it's gonna run just like this, and you're gonna see nothing in the output. And then what you're gonna to wanna to do is cd over to the go bin, and it's gonna look like this. Then you'll hit enter, and you're gonna automatically come into the directory like this. And then if you ls, you're gonna see the way back URLs within the file here. And the way we're gonna run this is with this dot slash and then the name of the tool that we wanna run. And just so you can see what it looks like, you can run a dash H and see the output here. Okay, so my other VM was freezing. So I went ahead and opened up a new one, which is just fine. It will all work the same. So I went ahead and installed it on this new machine and you're gonna find it in the go bin. And so if I run an LS, you're gonna see, I actually have a couple other tools in here, but I'm gonna show you how to install those in just a second. But this is the tool you just installed right here. So the way we're gonna run it is really simple, but first we need to create a target domain for us. So we're gonna gedit and I'm going to gedit yahoo.txt and we can just type in yahoo.com and this is gonna be our domain that we target. And if there's any subdomains in here, you would want to paste in like a sub.yahoo.com and I'm gonna show you how to grab these subdomains here in just a second. So we're gonna leave it just like this. We will save and now we can run the Wayback URLs tool and while it runs, I'll show you how to grab the subdomains. So what we'll do is cat that file that we just made and we're gonna run it into the Wayback URLs just like this. And then you can actually save all of those into an out file by pointing it over to the file you would like to call it. So we'll call it yahoo.urls and we'll let this run. And now while that runs, we're gonna go ahead and grab some subdomains. So we're gonna run an amas enum dash passive dash d yahoo.com and this might take a second and it's gonna give us a ton of subdomains that we would want to run the Wayback tool on. And so our goal is to find really old pages on these subdomains from the Wayback tool. 
that are gonna have some vulnerabilities. So we'll go ahead and close out of this. And what we're gonna end up doing is just grabbing like 10 of these because I don't really wanna run the Wayback Tool on all of these. You would run it on these if you were actually looking for any vulnerabilities within these pages. But my goal is just to showcase the tool for you. So we will copy some of these URLs and come back over here. And this is still running. So, oh, it just finished. So what we'll do is now we can g-edit our yahoo.txt like this and what you would do is you would run all of these subdomains in a file just like this so you might want to save this amass right here into an out file so that you don't have to copy and paste but that's okay that we're not going to do that and we're going to save this and now if we ran it it would run and grab the valid urls for all of these domain all of these subdomains for yahoo.com so now that we have that saved, what you would do is you would run this the exact same way you did right here, and it would run this Wayback tool on all of those subdomains that we just put in that file, and it would save them over here in the URLs for us. So what I want to show you is if we run a word count right here on this yahoo.txt, it's gonna show us, uh, that's the file that we made. So we'd wanna run it on the URLs, and, and it'll show us that we have more than 128,000 valid responses from the Wayback tool, and we don't necessarily want to visit all of these 128,000 URLs. And if we ran the Wayback tool with all of these subdomains, I bet we would have well over a million different URLs, and we don't really wanna check all of those. So now we wanna see which ones resolve in order for us to know which ones to target. So what we would do at this point is you're gonna run a sudo apt install HTTP probe, and it's gonna look like this. I already have it installed, so you can go ahead and run it. And then after you run it, you can type in HTTP probe to make sure that it's installed and it should turn blue for you, just like this. And the way we run it is the same way we would run the way back, just like this. So we're gonna go ahead and cat out our Yahoo URLs, just like this. And I'm gonna actually delete the valid URLs. You can save it into an out file if you want. I'm not going to, I'm just gonna let it spit out to the console and then cancel it. And so we would go ahead and run this. And I think this is URLs with an S like that. And it's gonna go ahead and start running this, all of those 128,000 URLs that we pulled down from up here. And it's gonna start printing the valid ones out down here in the terminal for us. So I'm going to go ahead and cancel that. The valid URLs are going to get printed out just like this into the terminal, or you could save them into an out file. And then once you have the valid URLs, you can start to look through which ones you think are juicy and you want to target. One other thing I want to show you is if we type in our HTTP robe, just like this, and we run a dash H just like this, you can start to see if you wanna give them a timeout in milliseconds. So I think there's a thousand milliseconds in a second. So if you wanted to run an HTTP probe and you didn't actually want to wait for it to try and resolve each one for the default of 10 seconds, which is kind of a long time, you could change this and see if the web URL resolves in like a second. That's probably what I would do. So I would run a dash T and I would say 1000 instead of 10,000. So that way it only takes a second before it moves on to the next URL. So if it went to this URL and it didn't resolve, by default, it's gonna wait 10 seconds to go to the next URL. And if you're running over a million subdomains, that's gonna take forever, especially because a lot of them are really old and are not gonna resolve. So I would run it with a thousand, so that way it's one second. So if this did not resolve within a second, it's gonna go ahead and go to the next one. So this is one of the most comprehensive ways to pull down the max number of URLs for you to target within a bug bounty program. In this video, I'm gonna show you how to find subdomains, which are gonna be really important for you if you do any kind of bug bounty hunting or penetration testing, because subdomains are usually targeted the least, and usually what happens is beginners just log into the main page and try and hack on the main page, and it doesn't really work out for them and they become really frustrated. So let's go ahead and jump into it. Okay, so here we are, we have opened up a terminal and you're gonna go ahead and sudo apt update and then you're going to type in sudo apt install sublister. And I just wanna show you sublister because it's really popular and I used to use it a lot, but I've really stopped recently because it's not pulling down as many domains as I would like. So if we just type in something like sublister and then yahoo.com, we'll see what it pulls down. So you'll type in sublister, 
dash D for the domain. Actually, we can type in a dash H for help and you can see what all it's able to do. So we're gonna type in a sublister dash D and then we'll just type in yahoo.com and it's gonna go out and search all these different search engines and then bring back the results. And remember when you see all of these subdomains that it brings back, that you need to check to make sure they're in scope. Sometimes I'll show you what I do is I just open this up and I'll be like, okay, here's a subdomain, here's a subdomain, and let's go through these subdomains. And I'll show you what I think is the best way to do this. So if you're in Firefox, you're gonna wanna download something called Open List Plugin, and we want it on Firefox. So we'll just go ahead and add this. And it's telling you right here what this is gonna do. It's gonna open multiple URLs at a time, which becomes really helpful for us. It says we want to add, we're okay with adding, and here it is. So we now have this right here. And what open list does is when you have all of these subdomains and you wanna see what happens, you can just copy these and then you can paste them in. So we'll just grab this one because I don't think it's gonna have anything on it, so we'll copy this one. We can come over to open list and we can just paste in a bunch of URLs. So what we would do is you'd really just copy a bunch of these instead of the same one over and over. And then when you hit open URLs, it's gonna open all of these tabs for you. It's gonna be a lot faster than having to open one at a time. So here they are, it opened all of those for us. So that's one way to check out the subdomains you do find, but that's not the purpose of this video. That was kind of just an afterthought that popped in my head as we were shooting this video. So you have sublister and here's a list of subdomains that it's brought down. And you might be able to say, well, that's a, that's a decent sized list. So we'll scroll through it here. It's fine, but it's, it's not as big as we would like. So one of the tools I've been using here recently is AMAS, and you can just type in AMAS-H, and you can see exactly what it does. And it's gonna tell you it's an in-depth attack, attack surface mapping and asset directory. AMAS is really cool if you can get it to work. So sometimes AMAS can be a little bit finicky, but it'll work for us for what we're about to do. You just type in AMAS, and then we wanna use enum, cause we're gonna do enumeration right here. And then if you hit a dash, if you just hit enter with AMAS enum, it'll tell you everything you can do with the enumeration. And we're actually gonna scroll up and we're gonna run a dash D and we're just gonna give it a, d a domain. And sometimes I like to run a dash IP to grab the IP addresses for the discovered names, which can be really helpful. So we're just gonna run amas enum dash d, and then we'll just run yahoo.com. Actually, now that I see this is running and it's actually taking a little while, let's go ahead and close out of this. I wanna run an amas enumeration, and I wanna run a dash passive, and then the domain right here, and then run this, and this should run a little bit faster than what we did have going. Okay, so amas is still running, but I wanna show you, look at all of these subdomains that it has pulled down for us. This is going to be way more. It's so many that my terminal is actually lagging. So we'll go ahead and close out of this so that way it stops. And if we just scroll through here, look at all of these subdomains. This has way more subdomains than we had with Sublister. It is an insane amount. So all of these subdomains, you'll wanna check to make sure that they're in scope, but look at all of these yahoos. Like, this is a crazy attack surface. If you can find a program that has a really wide scope, then you will, then most of the subdomains you find will be in scope, but make sure to always check. I can't believe I'm still scrolling. There has got to be like nearly a thousand subdomains right there. So AMAS is something you'll want to check out. I love AMAS enum, and then I run the passive because I think it runs a little faster, and then Yahoo. In this video, I'm gonna show you some cool recon tools that are gonna be able to help you figure out what kind of technology is running on a specific website that you may be trying to target, and an easy way to find out some version numbers and search for vulnerabilities. This can be really helpful for you to know what is being used and what technologies are running on a specific website, so that way you know what kind of attacks you should be looking for. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into it. All right, so here we are at tenant.hgb. This is a box from Hack the Box. I decided to use this because if there was something vulnerable on a live web application, I didn't want to accidentally show any information. So a few ways to find out what tech stack is being used is with a tool called Wappalyzer, and it is right here. I already have the extension installed, and you just come up here and you can click this extension, and it'll show 
show you what it is running. So you're running WordPress 5.6. Go to Google and type in WordPress 5.6, and then you can type in exploit or vulnerability and just read to see if there are any vulnerabilities or anything that needs to be patched with this specific vulnerability. Sometimes inside of here, you'll see something like this database. This is really helpful for targeting SQL injection. So you have a MySQL database. So if you find any places for any inputs, which I'm not sure if there are or not, you can try to pull off some kind of SQL injection. The Wappalizer tool is really helpful in giving you the programming language. So if we're on a web application and we are testing it, if there is something like the programming language of PHP, there are some very specific ways to go about manipulating PHP or checking for PHP type juggling. There's different things you can do knowing just the programming language. And then something like this right here, we have the web server is Apache. And you can do the same thing we did with the WordPress 5.6. And we can go out and see if there's any vulnerabilities here that maybe have not been patched for this specific website. So Wappalizer is a really great way to find out what kind of technology a web application is running. And so if you wanted to install this, you can just go to Google type in Wappalizer and you can type in Wappalizer and we want I'm on Firefox you might be on Chrome and we can do Firefox and then here's the extension and you can just come over here instead of remove you will click install and the second one I want to show you is the react developer tools this is a really cool extension it will be right here and whenever you're using something that's using the react framework it will light up for you so I went ahead and opened up Instagram and you can see it light up blue right here and it'll tell you this page is using the production build of react and so we know Instagram is using react and there's actually a lot of popular websites that use react such as uber eats discord Instagram Skype Pinterest and many others so knowing what is running such as react you're going to know that there's javascript and then the, there are a lot of common frameworks that are used within react and you can google those we're not going to go into those in too much detail and then one of my favorite websites is right here the w3 text this is going to do something very similar to wappalizer so right here you can just enter a specific url and it's going to tell you what is being used very similar to wappalizer so if we just type in yahoo.com it will pull back for us all of the technology that is being used so it says it has some server-side programming with java javascript jquery so you have this really old library right here and it tells you there is a newer version and so there's a lot of information in here and if you have any questions about something like javascript you can click on it and it'll tell you what javascript is or jquery and how it is used. So there is one other way to kind of find out what kind of tech stack is being used. So if you come in here and you have Wappalizer and we look at this, we can also come in and try to figure out what is being used within the JavaScript. Sometimes you'll be able to see comments or be able to work out what is being used on the website by coming in here and clicking on the debugger right here and it'll tell you here is the JS and we have the JavaScript and then you can click the pretty print down at the bottom and you can look through this JavaScript and see what you are able to find inside of here. So these are some of the common ways to find out what technologies are being used on websites. They can be really helpful for you to know what's going on and exactly how to attack a website. And these can be really helpful for you in your recon phase and maybe even lead you to some kind of vulnerabilities just because you have a version number given to you. Okay, so now I wanna show you the tool Nmap. And if you followed my channel for any length of time, you're familiar with the tool Nmap, but I wanna show you how I like to run this tool and the information I like to look at and pull back from my targets. So Nmap is a port scanner and if we run Nmap-H it's going to spit out for us all of the things that we can do with Nmap. One of my favorite things to do is run the dash V with a dash A. This is going to tell us about the open ports as they come back and this is going to give us all the information. So it's going to tell us right here enable OS detection. It's going to do script scanning and it's going to look for different versions as well. So we can go ahead and type in an Nmap dash A and usually you would run a dash p dash if you're doing like some kind of ctf but if you were doing a bug bounty program and you're not wanting to knock on the doors of all the ports you would just run the specific ports that you would like to see if they are open and so i've gone ahead and opened up a hack the box and so if we run this this is what it's going to look like and the dash v is going to give us back the ports 
as it finds them. So it says a port 80 is open and it has finished and it tells us about the open port. And one thing to note about Hack the Box is it says it did not follow the redirect. So it went out to see if port 80 was open. We were redirected to academy.htb. And if I actually wanted to open that up and I keep getting this not found right here, that is because I need to add this to my Etsy host file, but we're not going to do that right now. That's not the point of the video. And we are told we have the Apache version and it tells us our methods and it gives us these ports are open as well. So this is how I like to run in map. And so we will continue on. There is one last way to search for subdomains and directories that I think will be helpful for you to know. Specifically subdomains, we've seen this before dealing with directories, but we're gonna use the tool fuff. And this is the syntax that we're gonna use. We're gonna go ahead and fuzz for subdomains on yahoo.com. So the tool is pretty simple to use. We just type in fuff, the URL, which is going to be right here and the location that we want to fuzz which is for subdomains before yahoo.com and this is going to brute force for us any subdomains that come back with the status code 200 and then we're going to use our word list which is right here and then we're going to use a slowdown of one second so we can go ahead and run this and you should be able to see subdomains start spitting out as it finds them. And here are a few different subdomains. And I want to just, we'll stop this right here. I want to show you. So we got this 301, which I believe is going to be a redirect. But we have different sizes, different word sizes. So you might want to go and check these out anyway. But just in case we didn't want to see these 301s, what we can do is I think it is a dash FC. And we can say 301. And now it won't show us any of those 301s sometimes that comes in handy when you are fuzzing and you keep getting 401 or 403 and we really don't want to see those and so you can see here are some 200s so if we wanted to we could go out and look for these subdomains and see if any of them look interesting to us now I have mentioned this before you can also fuzz for directories and you can use the fuzz like this in this location and now if we run it it's going to look for directories and lastly one thing i also want to mention is when you are fuzzing for apis fuff is also a really great tool for this so we'll go ahead and delete this and if we were going to be looking for let's say there's an api that looks like this api dot yahoo.com and we wanted to fuzz for valid endpoints and see what we could find we would just go ahead and run fuff like this and look for endpoints and then go out to the web page if we are able to and look at the json if not i have a tool that will fuzz apis for us and actually give us the json right here in our terminal and you can go check that video out i'll link it in the description if you would like to build that tool it'll save you some time having to go out and look at the json itself and it'll just print it right here in the terminal for you. So with that, that is fuff and how we fuzz for subdomains and directories. All right, so it is always good to have a couple of tools in your tool belt. So you can go ahead and run derb like this and we can run a yahoo.com and we don't really need any more than just this right here. So it's just an HTTP S and then we'll run yahoo.com and it'll automatically start fuzzing for us just like that it's really simple to use so sometimes fuff might give you some errors or it's not working quite right and it's always good to know of other tools one of the cool things about derb is you can run it recursively and so once it runs all the way through your word list and it let's say it found yahoo.com football the next time it runs it'll run yahoo.com football and then it will look for more directories within that football directory which is really cool so Derb is also a backup fuzzer just in case Fuff isn't working for you. Another helpful tool that you're going to use, especially inside of CTFs, is WP Scan, and you're going to use this with WordPress sites. So I've gone ahead and opened up Hack the Box, and I have a tenant running here. And if you have a Hack the Box subscription and you're wanting to follow along, you will need to add tenant.htb to your Etsy host file which I have already done. So the WP scan tool is gonna go out and look at all of the plugins on the WordPress site and see if any of them are vulnerable, if any of them are out of date. It's going to check the actual theme and see how old it is and how long it's been since it's had updates. And we can go ahead and check out WordPress scan right here, the WP scan help. 
and it will tell us all of the different flags and everything that we are able to use and one thing that I can never remember what it actually looks like is this right here is the dash dash plugin detection so what we will do is we'll type in WP scan dash dash URL HTTP slash slash and then we're going to go tenant.htb and then this dash e right here is going to tell it that we want to check all of the plugins. I sometimes call it all ports out of habit, but I think it's all plugins. We can actually just look if we scroll up. We're going to enumerate all plugins right here and we want to use the dash dash and then we want plugins dash detection and then we want to use aggressive and then you can do a dash o if you want to save this in a, in a file i pretty much never do that i'll just open a new tab and come back sometimes i'll have a whole bunch of tabs open up here and it's not always that helpful so it will flag things like this and tell you that a version is out of date and i told you this in the last video but i especially am really bad with WP scan because you get a lot of information, but you should read all the way through all of this. I remember doing a CTF about six months ago and I ran a WP scan and I just like skimmed through it and I ended up missing a vulnerability that gave me remote code execution and I wasted several hours of my time enumerating when I should have just read the entire scan. So make sure you read the entire scan when you run one. It might take you a little bit of extra time, but it will always be worth it because it will give you information even if you think it might not be helpful. It's like right here, it doesn't flag this, but it might be worth going out and checking this version 5.6. It's insecure on this specific release, and you can go and check this these different version numbers, and this might take a little while because we're running the aggressive, but that is okay. So this is WP scan. You're going to want to run this whenever you come across WordPress web applications. It is going to be your friend. You're going to use it regularly throughout your penetration testing career, especially in the world of CTS. And always remember, read the output. In this video, we are going to cover how to choose a bug bounty program for you to attack. One of the first things you have to do is figure out a target that you want to start doing your recon on. And sometimes people can become paralyzed by analyzing all the different targets and trying to figure out which one they want to attack first. And so I want to try and help you figure out how to narrow down your options and then specifically choose one and then start your recon process with. So before we jump into this too far, I kind of wanted to give you a little bit of encouragement. And I'm not really a Star Wars fan, but I came across this quote a really long time ago and I found it to be really helpful. And it says, you want to know the difference between the master and the beginner? The master has failed more times than the beginner has even tried. And I think this is really helpful when trying to figure out how these top hackers are finding so many bugs and so many other people are struggling. It is because they have dedicated a lot of of time to specific platforms and to learning this craft and so we just have to keep moving forward every day and you'll be getting better when life gets you down you know what you gotta do i don't want to know what you gotta do just keep swimming just keep swimming just keep swimming 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 what do we do we swim so i decided to add just keep moving forward to a t-shirt recently because it really does show the perseverance that you have to have in the field of cybersecurity. So let's go ahead and take a look at Hacker One and narrow down some potential targets. And I'm gonna show you my process for doing this. So let's go ahead and jump into it. So here we are on Hacker One, and one of the first things I like to do is come in to the hackers and then we need to go to the directory so that we can start looking for different programs. And now I like to click launch date and I like to sort by the date. I wanna go from the newest first. I accidentally clicked it one too many times. And I actually believe you had to be logged out of HackerOne to have this feature work. So if you're logged in, go ahead and log out. And then you can look through here. And then once you have them all sorted out, one of my favorite things to do is open them up and look at the scope. I like to see how big the scope is and make sure that there is a really large scope because one of my personal biggest struggles is I will open up a program and I'll get started and then in 20 minutes I find myself out of scope and this can be a problem. So I really like to have large scopes. It also means that you have a lot larger attack surface and there's gonna be a lot more diversity 
diversity and where different bug bounty hunters have been looking and testing and so you're more likely to find a bug so let's go ahead and scroll through some of these and let's look at some of the scopes so maybe we can look at this link tree i have actually never looked at this but you can scroll down and look to see how large their scope is and it seems like they have a pretty large scope and then you need to make sure you stay away from these specific ones and so make sure when you are searching for a target that it has a large scope and one of the second things you should search for is something that you're really familiar with so I've noticed that there can be a lot of like currency trading programs on here and I'm not familiar with a lot of the online currency trading programs so that's something that I'm going to just avoid but maybe you're into shopping and you're like I want to check out Fossil I want to see what kind of scope they have and you can come in here and read about it maybe you're really into gaming and I'm pretty sure here's GameStop there are quite a few game style programs on here and you can go ahead and attack those i'm pretty sure playstation is on here gamestop is on here and if you're familiar with those websites already those are going to be something you're going to want to attack because you're going to already know how the web app functions and what should be happening when you click on different links or log in and so pick a program that you personally are familiar with and are already interested in and a sub point to this is pick a program that you're really interested in because you are going to be interested in clicking through the website seeing what's happening what products there are and maybe you'll be interested in looking at the products and it's going to help you figure out how the website functions just because you're going to be a normal user and there's going to be things on the website that you want to look at and click through and check out the functionality but you're also really interested in what they have to sell this is going to really help in keeping your interest and so pick a program that you're familiar with or one that offers some kind of service that you're really interested in or products that they're selling that you would be a potential buyer of now the reason i told you to sort the programs by date is because the newer the program the less likely they are going to have already been tested by a bunch of different penetration testers or bug bounty hunters and this is really going to help you land a vulnerability before anyone else because the web application just hasn't been picked over as much as the older programs and a, another tip to this and is really popular and probably really common knowledge is to choose a program that is unpaid so you can come down to one of these unpaid programs and hack on one of those because the top hackers are going to be going after the programs that offer rewards and financial gain because they're doing this for a living and if you're just trying to get that first bug then you can go for the unpaid programs and then also the newest unpaid program and the last tip is kind of an OSINT tip and I think this is really going to help you in your ability to find bugs based on what the developers are posting so go on to all the social medias and follow the developers that work for a specific company so if i was going to come over here to mongodb i'd want to find the developers that work for mongodb on twitter find their github pages follow them on any social media that i can because developers will often brag about the different software that they're using and they're implementing into different projects and then lastly they're going to be pushing their new code to github and if you are following them on github you can go and check out the code that they have published before anyone else and see if you can find any vulnerabilities within there or maybe they have pushed some sensitive information to github that they otherwise shouldn't have and so following the developers is going to be really helpful and and one last thing the developers will often do is when they launch a new subdomain or a new area of the web application that wasn't previously launched they'll often post about it and they'll tell you what is going on on that specific page and following the developers is one of my last tips in trying to choose a program if there are a lot of developers that you have the opportunity to follow on a specific program this is going to help you be one of the first ones to find new pages as well as code that is being pushed to github thanks for watching